Good morning, everyone, and welcome to activities for people living at home with dementia. We are proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available for viewing through a YouTube channel for future use. I am your host for today's activities. Our topic today is brought to you by Peggy Spear with the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. She's going to show us Make It New. And I can't wait to see what this is all about. Peggy, take it okay. away. Thank you for the setup, Martha. <coughs> Here we go. So Make It New. Right now, we reinstalled our galleries. Um, now, I think it's been almost two years ago. And one of the galleries that our curator of the 20th Century Artworks uh, titled was Make It New. And so it was this moment in um, American, American art, broad, broader sense of art, dance and music and, and visual art, um, where artists were looking at existing things, but in new ways. And so um, the poet, I'm sure you've heard of the poet Ezra Pound, coined the phrase, make it new. And so it was really the phrase that 20th century advocates used to embrace modernism. So Make It New manifested itself in very different ways. One of the major ones was um, basically it was representational was now obsolete. That was, that was a thing of the past. Realism was a thing of the past. Let's think in abstract terms. So it was... Um, repurposing things that already existed uh, in, in a way that was totally different. You know, we'll look at some artworks where that, that happened. Or it could have been looking back to past types of art making, but bringing it into the 20th century in a way that made more sense. Or it was creating brand new styles of art like cubism, which I'm sure you've heard of that, of that type of um, movement, cubism. So we're gonna look at three different artworks that um, all of them are sculptural, but it was not just sculptural art that was um, revolutionizing. It was all forms of artwork, photography, works on paper, oil on canvas, but we're just gonna look right now at sculpture. So this is a pretty funky one. It's entitled Soap Bubble Set Lunar Space Object. Can you tell me what we see? Um. Well, a lunar shot. A wine glass. A, a drinking glass, yes. A, a pipe for a, a bubble, pipe. I yep. guess. Yeah. yeah, it's a clay bubble pipe. And then the white bubble on top. Yeah, it's a cork ball. That's actually what that is. Yeah. But yeah, it looks like a bubble. And some kind of a chart. Yes. There's a chart here. It's got numbers in columns. And then there are two metal pipes going across with a ring around it. Yes. Yep. And then you can't see it in this particular angle, but there's a seashell on the right side uh, ball. I, I see, yeah. You can see a part of it, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the pipe is on the ground or on the, the bottom, and then there's a shell just barely touching or barely off of the, the opening of the pipe. Hmm. So let's let's start working through this. We see the moon. We know the title is Lunar Space Object. Can we start assigning maybe some meaning to what we see? So, so bubble, someone, you know, or I think Steve pointed out the, the bubble pipe. Yes. What do bubbles look like as you start to blow them out? They're kind of clear and, and rainbowy. Clear, rainbowy. What shape are they? Round. 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 It's so, almost like almost like the moon. ring is hanging there. Yes. So <coughs> they're all. If you start pulling it apart, the little bubbles could be little planets. Mm. The ring could be maybe Saturn's ring. Okay. Be another just another circular idea of. Mm a planet, mm -hmm. but they all have that, that 
circular shape to it, which also not only could it mean a, be a planet, but it's also reinforcing the shape of what do we see in the background? The moon. The moon. The moon. The, moon. the, moon. the same that, thing that, with that cork ball. That white it, vertical line almost looks like bubbles in a fish tank. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it does. So he would find these are all objects that he found from his world. And those images, like that image of the moon, I think he removed from a textbook and then pasted it to the back of this kind of, it's like a diorama. It's actually called an assemblage. Textbook. textbook. Um, because these are all objects that he, that existed and he uh, put together to create a different meaning. So this is really thinking inside that idea of making it new. Objects that seem pretty, pretty different, not seeming to have any real connection to each other, are all now kind of uh, given the umbrella of this idea of a lunar, of a lunar uh, <coughs> creation. Mm -hmm. On the bottom left, is that a little person in the screen? On the left Next here? On the left. left, left. Oh, left. Next uh, to the glass? No. It, I think it's um, like glue and shadow. And okay, it, it almost looks like a little... Almost looked like a little person. I can see what you're saying, like right here. Yeah, no, wow. I think it's just how it was assembled. There's no okay. Um, okay. visual assi assignment to that. Okay. So, so I'm not sure what the, the wine glass means. Is it, was it <laughs> no. bubbly champagne or something? I, you know, I from my research, I couldn't find anything specific about why he included that drinking glass. So this, um, the, there are several in this. It's not a series, but it was something he was really really fascinated with this idea of um, the moon, of lunar, of, of solar. And so he created these soap bubble box sets. And um, this drinking glass appears in a few of them, but I can't find anything on, on how that necessarily ties to this greater idea of lunar. Okay. Um, but so the pipe was something- Well, you know, fly, fly me to the moon, I guess, you know? Yeah. Bubbles fly you to the moon. Right, there, yeah, that, that idea, I, I think it is speaking to the bubbles, or bu it's not a champagne flute, but it could be some sort of sparkling something that you might- Yeah, like. yeah. Um, there, okay, so the, the clay pipe, so it blows bubbles, but this was also something that he was really enjoyed as a child. And as a child, he was very interested in space. Um, so that was, it's kind of a, a little biographical inclusion he has there. The seashell. Now, what do we think the seashell might have to do with the moon? Maybe the ebb and flow. Yeah, yeah. the tide. The tide. The tide, yeah. Exactly right. It's it's a nod to the power the moon has <coughs> on the tides. So that that's his little nod to the power of the moon there. Those parallel rods that Yetta pointed out. Talk, you know, it could be speaking to those that track that the you know the rotation of planets around the sun oh, while yeah. it you know it's it doesn't veer from that path. And so it you know if you were to tip that the ball would actually move. So there's that idea of, you know, if it does move, it's only moving in one direction or, you know, yeah. it's only moving in one, on one, one path. Yeah. But there's a, there's a, a romanticism to, or, you know, a kind of a sweetness or a nostalgic feeling to this. It doesn't feel like a bunch of random things kind of junky. It's created in a way that tells a kind of a romantic story about the, the sun or, you know, our solar. And you can see, you know, someone pointed out the numbers on the side. Those are um, our annotations, star annotations. Oh, okay. You know? So there's a very scientific inclusion to this. While there is this kind of romantic inclusion to this, you know, the bubbles. So One of the things that... It reminds me of romanticism is actually the frame. It's not a stark, you know, in your face frame. It's more of a <coughs> soft uh, wooden frame. Yeah. It kind of makes mellows it out to me. 
it, you're, you're right. That's a really good point, Steve. It, it sort of has that feel to um, something you might have had in your own home growing up. Um, maybe not the diorama itself, but you know, you would have maybe something in that frame, that pine, or you had, you know, you found an old frame at an antique store or a vintage shop, or you, something that you're giving it another life. It definitely has that <coughs> softness to it. Could could it represent? And this sums it up. He's looking through the window. It's the window, and you're looking out at the moon. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, very much. Hey, I have I have a question, Peggy. Mm -hmm. When this was done in 1959, the, the United States was just on the verge of a full blown space program. Did that influence? Do you think that influenced him in any way? Thousand percent. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that is such a great point, Don. Yes, he was very interested in the space race and it was right after world war ii so it was something that was you know the country's on the up and up this is giving us hope you know for what was a sad <coughs> decade before so now this was something he was very very interested in and it was on a lot of people's minds so there was that immediacy for a lot of people about oh my gosh we're, yeah the moon we're trying to get ourselves to the moon so there was there was a lot of topical relation to this as well as maybe past emotional or scientific. It, it was a pretty layered piece. So we have, um, uh, you know, we have this program here and I, I think I might have mentioned it before, but as a, you know, just a refresher, we have every year we select four local artists that um, we work with. They're called Carter Community Artists and they work with us in a variety of ways, teaching, um, doing programs. And that one of the things they do is we have them select their, one of their favorite pieces in our collection that um, inspires them or their, you know, kind of speaks to their practice of art making. And this year, um, one of our artists name is Casey Short, and he was really drawn to this particular um, artwork because he does a lot of assemblage and, and um, sculptural works. And so I'm just going to read one of a couple of the lines of why he was drawn to this. He says, I was drawn, drawn to Cornell soap uh, bubble set immediately because of the layered mixed media and conceptual weight behind the work. The objects inside, like the seashell metal ring and bubble pipe, speak to both art and artifact. The way in which this piece was created suggests that Cornell was making this work in its present time, but for the future. So while, you know, we, while it was relevant to the space race, even now we still... Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by, and, you know, we're in another space race now, really, but we're, you're fascinated by solar or yeah. by lunar. So I have one more um, little, we have a video that one of our other educators is reflecting on. Um, I apologize in advance if you can't hear the sound. I don't know how, to, what I'm doing to make it not have the sound, but there are closed captions. And she's, it's just a one minute video of her reflecting on her experience with students in the galleries um, on this particular artwork. I've had the good fortune as a gallery teacher to work with lots of students in our galleries. And one of the objects that almost always catches their attention is by Joseph Cornell, who was one of the earliest artists in the United States to use found objects often from popular culture and often mass produced in his work. Here he equates planetary objects like the moon with soap bubbles through a clay pipe that a child might use to blow bubbles in the yard and a cork ball and an image pulled from a children's book reference the moon. A seashell in the lower right hand corner suggests the connection between the gravitational pull of the moon and the oceans. Students are always fascinated by Cornell's use of a text from a book in French, no less, on the back of the box. And you can look in the mirror on the display to see this detail. Cornell thought about his creations as magical and felt strongly about their capacity to transport himself and his viewers to worlds imagined. So just a, another perspective. Children always love looking at that one in, in the gallery. And just for um, reference, it's about 14 inches long by 10 inches high, four inches deep. So it's not, it's not big, it's about the size of a shoe box, but, or, you know, not, you know, flat wise, but um, it's a pretty cool piece nonetheless. All right, so now totally different. 
but created um, in this idea, during this idea of Make It New, is this uh, sculpture entitled Head Abstraction by a, a man named Robert Laurent. So it, again, it's really hard showing sculpture on screen because this particular piece is meant to be viewed in the round, which it's in a pedestal in the middle of the gallery and you can walk around 360 to see it. The Cornell, the last one we looked at is hanging on the wall. So that is meant to be viewed more two dimensionally. This is truly meant to be viewed in the round. Mm. But it's called head. So are we able to kind of start to place attributes to this? Well, we, I think what part of the following part will play is probably hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easier to see the right picture that it's a head. Yeah. Right here. Because yeah. you have the ear and the eye and the hand yes. out of the front yes. of the face. Yeah. Oh, so you're seeing a hand over the face? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. Here it looks like it might be a, a bun, some sort of, mm. which which, what, are you feeling it's pulling towards one gender or another? Or do you think it's just a, a base, a generic head? What are people feeling? I see an elephant. You see, okay. Let's oh. <laughs> tell me about it, sister. Elephant man. Uh, yes. On the right side, about a third of the way down, there's an eye right okay. where you are. And then this long nose right next to it. Oh, okay. It goes into the yeah. collar. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I hate to break it to you, Martha. It's not an elephant. That's okay. But I love it. <laughs> I am the beholder. Yes, exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. So this is a head of what he identified as a, as a girl. An ugly girl, okay. So he said, um, all right, so he, this particular artist, um, Laurent, was, and how to make, this is, I'm pulling it into the Make It New, what his technique was, is he would find wood in his backyard, at the beach, wherever, and he would directly carve right into the wood. And Martha and Donna, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at what that, that flower form was, that tall mm -hmm. flower. This is the same artist, and he's using that same method here. Okay. Where he's using a piece of mahogany wood he has no sketching, planning, idea what he's going to carve into it before. He just starts going. And as he goes, his hand, it's all intuition. His hand leads him through the grain of the wood. And this is what he ended up with. Okay. He had no idea that it was going to be at the head of a girl. And so this, this particular type of method is called direct carving was he's the first American, he's assigned as one of the first American and, and the best known American to employ this method in carving. It had been done, you know, uh, Michelangelo used to do this out of stone, but it hadn't been done in a long time. It hadn't been done in the US. And so he brought it to the 20th century, but he was not doing it in a classical form. He was using this 20th century of make it new abstraction in what has been often a, a past technique that was very traditional. So he says um, about this specific piece, it turned out abstract. I didn't mean it to be. It was a head of a girl. I saw shapes and I followed them. Kind of like some uh, wood carvings, you wouldn't recognize what they are yeah. and what yeah. I intended them to be. Yeah. yeah. And where, did you paper. just kind of go where your hand went or did you it, it's, start yeah, off? What it, Whatever cut, you know, whatever the cut was, that's kind of in some of it. And, you know, I thought I had what I might mind, but my hand didn't go that way. Uh -huh. mm. And Don? No, I was just going to say, uh, I have the same uh, kind of d different media, but uh, sometimes what I start painting is not what I entirely started to, to think it was. Cool. So some of and, it. And uh, that's such a happy accident when those happen. Yeah, it is. Uh, but he really embraced it and he was really, he really was well known for it. And so um, he was, you know, he was working in a ring of other, he was an immigrant um, to the United States and he spent a lot of time in France and then he was back in the US. And so he was very influenced by abstract art. Um, and it was in vogue at the time when he was carving this 
during the 20s, realism came back because of the depression. It was just anything abstract just felt too elitist. After the depression, abstraction came back. So that last one we saw, you know, was after it was almost uh, 1960. Abstract yes. was back in vogue. This was before the depression. Abstract was in vogue. And so um, it was, it was again, this exploring of a, of a old technique, but making it a new, a new uh, technique to artists of the day. Hey, hey Peggy, how, mm -hmm. how big is it? Uh, it is 15 inches high, eight inches wide, six inches deep. Mm. It's not big. It's a tabletop type of thing. But it's still a good chunk of wood. Yeah, it is. These and it's mahogany. Yeah. Mahogany is very hard wood. It is so a hard wood, yes. He, and the folds, he, um, that was something that kind of came and he, would, he was surprised to see these folds coming. He talked about so... It was just as much as a surprise to him as it was to everybody else. And he um, was a, a magnificent carver, carved dressers, carved his own uh, bed, headboard. Um, and then was folk art was um, something he was, that was inspired by. So people who did not have formal training, but were carving, you know, uh, into to wood, wooden toys, rocking horses, things like that. Those are things he collected. So um, it, it showed itself in his art this way. Do people like this type of abstract sculpture? Mm, I like it. It's, uh, it's a little too abstract for my taste. Janine, what about you? I know you're our abstract queen. And Janine, you're on mute. She might just be enjoying by listening today. Or she it, might it, be <laughs> it depends upon this perspective. The one on the left is more pleasing to me than the one on the right. Yeah. Mm. See, and I like the right, the right one better because it's yeah. the half face and the <coughs> excuse me, the hair flowing down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the head <coughs> sort of sealed it. Yeah. <coughs> when you yeah. walk into the gallery space, the the you are addressed by the front. <coughs> what is to be the actual face of the, the, um, the girl, that's what looks at you first when you approach that sculpture. <coughs> but it's meant to be viewed all around, so. All right, we got one more. Oh, and this is the bottom of it, which I just think is kind of interesting when you get to see the, <coughs> the sides of a sculpture that you don't get to see. So this is just kind of, it's sort of like a passport to different galleries. It's different yeah, mm -hmm. that's cool, I like that. Yeah. All right, so some of, it, some of you have seen this with me before. Some of you might be seeing it for the first time, but Louise Nevelson is just so dang cool, and this artwork is just the neatest. So we're going to look at it again because it was really, um, she was so impactful in um, ABEX. Peggy, I'm going to have to leave. Bye, Steve. Right. Thank you, folks. See Everybody, you we'll see you tomorrow. See you later. Bye, Bye. Steve. Bye. <coughs> But this uh, particular artwork is, it's made almost the same exact time as our lunar bubble box. Mm -hmm. And it's got another, another moon theme called lunar landscape. So what, what jumps out at you first? Mm -hmm. I don't really see a lunar landscape there. <clears throat> I no. don't. Okay. What did you say, Yetta? I don't see a landscape, a lunar landscape. Okay. <clears throat> it's fair it's enough. It looks like a clockwork, you know, the inside of the clockwork. Oh my always. goodness. Yes, you're right. It totally does. And it's got that verticality too. It's really tall. <coughs> it's 86 inches tall. So it's taller wow. than me. And it's about uh, 50 inches wide about. So it's, it's got a massive presence in the gallery. Wow. That's seven feet plus. Yeah, it's pretty big. Wow. And, and she was, um, she's, big feminist and was one of the, she was the one that made it so the stereotype that only men could make monumental sculpture were the ones doing it. She said, not on my watch. And then she started <laughs> making these amazing, um, massive sculptures. But what was really cool, she's New Yorker. She was an, um, I believe she immigrated to the United States and, mm -hmm. and um, from Russia. And she 
created these, they're called assemblages, sort of like Cornell's, from found objects. In New York City, she'd walk around and go through piles of trash <laughs> to find what she would wanted to use. And so you can see here, you see a juggling pin at the very top. Yeah. You can see the seat of a chair wow. right here. There's a bed post tucked in this little cubby. So she'd walk around this, you can see this is like a, a broken crate. Bed post, there's a spoon, a wooden spoon. You can see all sorts of odds yeah. and ends that yeah. she would just walk around New York. One man's junk is another man's treasure and she would bring it back to her studio. And so she would create these sculptures and she would put them in this particular phase of her career, she would she was putting them in these cubes, these locked boxes to create almost the effect of cubism that was in vogue earlier in, in the, the century, creating that cubism, but through sculpture by actually putting things in cubes. So the lunar landscape, this is where it, she converts it to a lunar landscape. All of these you can imagine were different colors, different, different types of wood, different, you know, the juggling pin might have even been painted. Who knows what type of wood that sea chair is? Maybe a, a you know, a mahogany bed post, who knows? Well, she flattens the surface by painting everything one color. And in this instance, it's black. So it's often black, white, or gold is usually the palette she was working in. And she painted it all black to create the, the feel of what, or the look of the moon. And then called it lunar landscape because all of these different boxes and ups and downs created what she felt would have been the, the ups and downs of meteor on, a, on the moon. Mm. On the surface. On the surface. Okay. On the surface of the moon. So that's where the that's where she got that title from. And when she would display these in gallery, which it's not displayed here this way, but when she was you know working with different galleries out of New York, she would have them um, dramatically lit and black light lit lit to create almost like an immersive experience with in with the viewer and that space to make you feel as if you are actually on a lunar surface. It, you know, if this would have been painted during the time where we actually were landing uh, things on the moon, before even before the people uh, uh, Neil Armstrong went to the moon, uh -huh. I could see I could see how this would be a, a mixture of, of uh, machine and and uh, and and uh, the surface of the moon. Um, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I see down in the back, bo the bottom right hand corner. Mm -hmm. That, that to me would be look like a, a, a person flying an aircraft or, or a, a rock or a, a, a yeah a, 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 a rocket yeah. like a spaceship or something spaceship yeah she doesn't speak directly to anything like that mm -hmm. or, or anything with the space race or rockets or anything like that she was really focused on nature the experience of nature <coughs> So in this particular case, it's just the the lunar surface. That okay. like she was so interested in recreating natural phenomena that that this is what she was really interested in, and less about the si the mechanics of what it was what was going on in the world at that time. Yeah, I think some some aspects of it could clearly be things on the moon in an abstract mm -hmm. way. I mean, this, this, this panel, this part right here, oh, you can't see where I'm pointing. The, 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 the part, the big box on the left, Okay. that looks like it'd be, oh no, that, that, not that one, the next one over. The this one, one with the shovel? Yeah. Yeah, that looks like it could be a, something from a lunar uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see that. It's dimensional. Yeah, it's, I think the, the familiar shapes of these circles add a little bit of that craterness Yes. That she might be yes. trying to speak to, but then these dark shadows and high yeah. peaks, also you know, created by this this stool seat that you know is coming out at us, add to that maybe terrainy 
feel that we would be seeing pictures of the moon or when they're driving their buggies on the moon. It, it's yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but also too, I mean, if you were to imagine yourself, it would feel totally different if she painted it red and white. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you'd get a totally different vibe or if yeah. she painted it all white, it wouldn't feel as lunar maybe as her painting it all black. So maybe this it, is, oh, go ahead. Maybe this is the dark side of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> or the unknown. It could be. But the, so this was um, the shadow of the moon. Mm -hmm. the sh yeah, shadow. And she was really interested in other themes in nature like this. Um, so it, it could just be, you know, all of it was fascinating to her. And she okay. um, eventually started creating, this is all wood. <coughs> then began um, experimenting later in her career with, with sheet metal and aluminum, mm -hmm. um, which allowed her to move these types of sculptures from indoor spaces to outdoor spaces, oh. which again, um, female sculptors, we're not doing that. So it was, it was really groundbreaking for her to, um, to kind of hang with the big dog guys yeah. that are, were doing these types of things. So did she have patrons that were uh, supporting her to do these kind of things? I'm not, you know, she had galleries in New York yeah. and she was well known while she was alive and, and museums were exhibiting her work as well as galleries while she was alive. So she did have a following and, um, okay. and she, and, now, most at most American art museums, any museum that um, collects American art has maybe not one of these massive sculptures because this is like a real masterpiece, but has pieces of hers because, you know, she's such an iconic artist now um, in the American canon of art. And she was, she was a cool, funky character. She wear big fur coats walking around New York and whole black hair and would wear cool scarves in her hair. I mean, she really fit the, the bill for an avant-garde artist. And, and so um, her work paved the way for a lot of other female abstract artists because she was so such an icon. Hey, Peggy. Yeah. One more thing about all of these. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there's no, usually on the paintings and the, and the photographs, there's some sort of note about where, the collect, where they were collected from. Uh, who donated them to the museum? I don't. I don't know these, how that works. These did not have any um, specification in collection, okay. so they were probably just acquired through our acquisitions committee. Okay. Um, if they were gifted to us, that's and the and the gifter wanted it known, we would have to put gift from, yeah. or it would be. Um, if it were spent from a certain type of money that requires a, a, a <coughs> call out, that would yeah. be there too. So yeah. if you don't see it, then there was no real um, restriction on how that money needed to be spent okay. or whatever. So okay. yeah, so these are all just part of our permanent collection. Yeah. And all of these are on view right now. And as long as I've been here, they've been on view. So um, <laughs> these aren't going away anytime soon. That's kind of the niceness of some sculptures. They, they tend to stay out much longer than anything else. So yeah. if ever you happen to be in our galleries, you will find them all within arm's reach of each other in the same gallery. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd be pretty impressed if I went in and saw this particular one staying there. I'd have to look at it for a long time because it, it'd, have a bigger, it'd have a bigger scale I think it's huge and we have I created a couple of years ago for um, sometimes we have it when we're in a touch environment because of COVID we have a cart that we roll out and we have I spray painted a bunch of blocks black blocks so you can build next to this artwork you can try to build your own sculpture we've got popsicle sticks and all these other random thing, wood pieces okay. um, that you can try your hand at creating your own version of a lunar landscape is this a piece that has a backside to it or you have to watch it this way? It is backed up against the wall. If okay. There's no, um, this particular artwork is not meant to be viewed in the round. And a lot of her sculptures like this were, were designed to be flat up against the wall. Okay. Yeah. I, I will say that this, uh, this, this one uh, box on the, the right side that, helps, the, uh, that has this, the chair seat in it. Oh, uh-huh. That really looks like an evil eye looking at me. So, doesn't it? Yeah. 
<laughs> eyebrow and eyeball. Ooh. Yeah. It's giving you the side eye. The oh, bad dental oh. work right here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Woo. Sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, this is a fun piece. And I know we've looked at it before, but it's one of those pieces that every time you look at it, you have a different experience with it. Exactly. So. All right, friends. Well, this is where I leave you. Next week is um, we're doing medical. So we're going to look at different artworks we have in our collection that are a nod to our people in the medical profession, which we know this last year, if we didn't give them a nod, I don't know mm -hmm. what year we would ever need to give them a nod. It's just been amazing for our country. So um, we will spend a little time with those in our collection. Okay. Peggy. Uh, right. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Peggy. Bye, y'all. Be good. Thank I'll you. Have a good week. You too. See ya. Yeah. Bye. Wow. Poof. <laughs> Poof. So is, is, <laughs> is Woodstock having trouble seeing the screen? <laughs> yeah. Looking through a micro, my, looking he needs a magnifier. Uh, magnifier uh, glass. He's playing with it, and I don't want to take it down because he's having too much fun. <laughs> Yeah, I think he was having a little trouble with the screen. <laughs> bye bye, Nancy. Nancy, poof, she goes away at 11, too, I guess. Yeah. Ah, well, I tell you what, let's uh, move right on into um, Fifth Street Cafe.